Salvation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one crown. Then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be mad. The whole earth echoing his eminence His name would burst from sea and sky And from rivers to the mountaintops We'd hear Christ be magnified so much but the Bible says let the redeemed of the Lord say so so if we the people of God who have been redeemed set free our eternities changed if we can just lift this up 
as an offering, joining with all of creation, magnifying the one who has redeemed us, who has saved us, and who is worthy. Let's lift this up as the redeemed of the Lord we sing. And oh, Christ be magnified, and let his praise arise. And Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. And Christ be magnified in me. Amen. So when we sing that song, I'm just thinking about how it's easy for us to sing Christ be magnified when we're all together like this in the room, right? And I've had so many people ask, like, is it like this on the normal weekend? Yes and no. Because I'm pretty sure everybody in here knows Jesus and knows what we're going after. And when we gather on a weekend, we're coming with the reality that this world is a mess. You watch the news for five minutes everything that's going on, maybe in your own churches. You're worried about what you're going home to, a situation or an email that you've gotten while you're here, a discipleship or a pastoral moment that you're gonna have to deal with when you get back home with your sheep. Christ is over all. Christ is in all. And we're magnifying him with the life that he's given us because he's worthy, he's the only one. He is the only one who is worthy. I pray that this time has been refreshing to you. If you're a church leader or you're a pastor and you've just heard the saints singing around you. I pray that it's been sweet for your soul and that you'll take that back and that you would believe that God wants to take what he's done here and then use that, that it would be contagious in your churches that your church too would be a church that sings and lifts up the name who's worthy, amen? Amen, let's do that here in this song. You're worthy, Jesus.
give him your praise this morning. Give the one who is worthy your praise. Come on. He is. Jesus, what we've just sung. Your word tells us that we don't have to weep anymore. For the Lamb of God was slain, that his blood was enough to pay for the sin that we so often forget is forgiven. Jesus, you're worthy of our worship, of our praises, of our prayers. Each church and each ministry, each life, each testimony that's in this room right now, God, I pray it would be for you. If it's not, it's for nothing. Solidify in our hearts a conviction, a desire, a passion, a hunger for revival in our churches and in this country, Lord. In this land, in your creation, until you return, when we will see you face to face, and we will sing, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and glory and power forever and ever and ever and ever. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Let's sit down together. great opportunity for us uh, to be together this week. Uh, I am so overwhelmed with uh, the things that I've heard that God has been doing, and uh, I am so grateful for uh, the opportunity that I've had to experience it. I, I just have had a refreshment to my own soul 
uh, to sing with you, to study with you, uh, to fellowship with you has been a great gift. And um, I am grateful for the team uh, who has led us in songs. Um, I love singing with uh, those leaders. I love singing with those instrumentalists. I love singing with that production team that is serving us because I know them. I know them. I pray with them. Uh, we've just been praying before we came out here together. Uh, we desire to be and then to lead, to be and to serve. And uh, it is sweet to know that they are pursuing Christ and uh, leading us then to pursue him with us. Around here at Christ Church, from the very beginning, uh, our metaphor for worship leadership is, in your preparation, hack the trail to the glorious vista of the glory of Christ. And then, for the beginning of the service, run back to the trailhead and get us. And tell us what you've seen and lead us to the vista. And uh, they do it. They sing with all their heart. They have uh, all of their uh, mind and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just incredibly grateful. And what Joshua said, people ask, is it like this on the weekend? I'll tell you as close as it gets to what we've had this uh, week together as a conference is when we sing, is he worthy? So that's like a baptism into Christ church life here is to sing, is he worthy? Um, and I do it four services in a row. I have no voice left and uh, I love every single second of it. He is worthy of our worship and uh, I've been thankful that we've given it to him this week together. Hey, let, just before... I got into God's word with you. I just want you to know how thankful I personally am for those who have communicated to us this week. I am uh, incredibly grateful for the investment of truth into our lives, practical, helpful truth, gospel, centrality, truth, um, the mission of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the word of Christ dwelling in them richly has resulted in our benefit. And uh, so those who have come from out of town, those who are part of our family here in town, uh, it's just been amazing. And uh, I want you to know how thankful I am and how uh, much we believe that God will bear fruit long-term from just a few days of interaction together around God's truth. So uh, I know that you have been impacted. I've heard that. I trust you agree with me uh, that when we say thank you to the Lord for uh, those who have brought God's word to us, it has been a sweet, sweet time together. And the theme of revival has held throughout. And I don't know if you've been tracking with that, but it has been. It's been holding throughout. We started with the posture that precedes revival, which is prayer. And then the agent of revival, who is the spirit of God, who is at work until the son of God returns for us. And uh, the message of the gospel is a functional and central gospel. It is the good news of salvation for sinners. And uh, Pastor Mike did such a masterful job of laying that down on us yesterday. And then last night, it's the mission that is the outcome of revival. What comes out of revival is the mission. We are not seeking God for some kind of emotional engagement together that we can say we had. We're seeking him to revive us so that his mission will go forward through us. Amen? Okay, so we're gonna finish our time now with one last opportunity in God's word. We're gonna call this the need for revival. Why is revival needed? And it is sin. It is sin. Sin is the great need in our pursuit and desire for the sovereign God of heaven and earth to work according to his own purposes and timetable to bring revival. It's sin. You know, as a group in this room, there are very few things that we relate to in exactly the same way across the entire room. Very few things, very few things that we relate to and would say we all agree in how to relate to these particular things. I mean, just think in just normal human life. Think about food. Food in this room has unique relationships that are diverse. Some of you are the sours people. Sours, you love those sours? Come on, like to feel those glands going, hurting. That's a good thing for you. How many of you are anti-sour? Sour is not your thing. How many of you are sweets people? Raise your hand again, okay? There's the sweets, okay? If it's gonna be a preference, if it's gonna be a choice, you're gonna relate to food with particular affection for the sweeter foods. 
How many of you are savory? You're salty people. Oh, give me the salty stuff. Okay. See, inside of this room, we do not relate to food. In fact, uh, perhaps at breakfast this morning, you were standing right next to somebody who related to food in a way that you did not. They accepted that food and you rejected that food. They were excited about that food and you were not excited about that food. Think about jeans. How about jeans? As in blue jeans, okay? We don't relate the same way. Some of you are okay with skinny jeans. Skinny jeans, come on out there. I get accused of wearing skinny jeans. I'm like, no, I'm just skinny legs. I, they're just in jeans. I don't know. <laughs> boot cut. Come on, boot cut. Where are you? Bell bottoms. Where are you? You know who you are. Bell bottoms. Yeah, you know who you are. Boot cut. That's for kids. <laughs> Straight leg. Come on. Straight leg. Okay. Straight leg with boots so that you get all bunchy on top. Who's doing that? That's the Westerners in the room. The equestrian community is present here among us. Mom jeans. Some men raised their hands. I, Tony, I was hoping that wouldn't happen, and I saw it. Let's assume you mean you like when your wife wears mom jeans. We don't relate the same way. We go to the same stores, and we look at the same rack, and we go, no, and somebody else says, yes, and we're all in the same room together. We don't relate to weather the same way. That's why some of us are smart and live here. <laughs> some of you like the cold. Heaven won't be cold. Some of you like the heat. We live in the center of the sun. Some of you like the wet. Some of you like the dry. Some of you like the snow. How many snow people? Snow people, you like the snow, you like it? Okay, we like to see the snow here and then leave. Like, oh, there it is. Let's go home. <laughs> you see, there are very few things, actually, in this room. And I could keep going. I'd go into sports teams. I'd go all that stuff. And we have an incredibly diverse relationship to various, very normal, everyday stuff in our lives. But as we conclude our time together here at VintageCon, I want to encourage you, I want to exhort you, actually, that we have to relate to sin the exact same way across the entire room. If we will be positioned for God to work reviving work in our churches and through our churches, in our communities, and around this world, in the midst of the darkness that Joshua referred to, it is dark. These are dark days. My heart is breaking for Europe as it plummets into war. These have been two years of death like our generation has never seen. These are dark days. And in order for us to be a people revived, to shine brightly in these days, to be a salty people in these days, we will be, we must be a people positioned relationally exactly the same way to sin. And I'm not talking about their sin out there. I'm talking about our sin in here. That's where this has to go. So we do share the same need for revival. And my hope is that God's word for a few moments this morning will secure us in the same relationship to the same need that is sin in our lives. I'm reminded of Romans chapter seven, where Paul says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Old man Paul says, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to a law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks, be to God through Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord. I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. We need revival because sin remains. There will be no revivals in our heavenly dwelling. In the new heaven, in the new earth, in the presence of the one who will be brighter than the sun, there will be no need for it because he will be here there will be no need for revival because the very presence of sin will be removed. The penalty of sin, of sin has been paid in full, amen? 
The power of sin has been broken entirely over us, amen? Through faith in the finished work of Jesus. But when we see him face to face, the very presence of sin will be removed, but not today. It, it's still here. We're still here. And as we seek the Lord to do the reviving work, we must relate the same way. So I'm taking up the task commanded to us in Hebrews chapter three to exhort one another so that we are not deceived by sin. Don't turn there, keep turning the pages to 1 John chapter one, where I'm gonna obey that command. And I trust the Spirit will, in fact, help us from 1 John chapter one, verses five through 10. These are the words of the eternal living God. superintended in their writing by the Apostle John, by the Holy Spirit of God, and preserved for us today at the final session of VintageCon by the kind and powerful providence of God. In our language, through the sacrifice of many who have laid down their lives for us to have this word, let's give it our full attention for just a few moments. I'll read it out loud. You follow silently there in your seat. Verse five of 1 John 1, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord for us now. Here's the big idea that's over top of our final session as we study these verses from 1 John. Remaining sin in me creates the need for ongoing revival in me. Remaining sin in me, and I would be so bold to say in you, remaining sin in me is what creates the need for ongoing revival in me. I am in perpetual need of the reviving ministry of the Spirit through the instrument of the Spirit, which is the Word, in the fellowship of the Spirit, which is the saints. It is remaining sin that creates the need for ongoing revival in me. And therefore, I must relate to remaining sin appropriately. We, universally, must relate to sin in the exact same way in order to be a people positioned before our Savior for the reviving work that he accomplishes in us and then through us for the mission that he has left us on planet Earth to accomplish. So how do we relate? Well, if we unpack these verses for just a few minutes, there are six relational requirements with sin that are right here on the surface. God's word is so precious to us. At times, you can walk through God's word, and just the, the, the gems are just laying on the surface. Just pick them up. Just pick them up. The truth is all over. It's so easy. Other times, you're mining down. You've got to dig down. You've got to think hard. You've got to see clearly as the Spirit illuminates the word. At times, the light comes on, and it's right there. At times, we've got to get the light on and dig and get the light on and dig and get the light on. This is just right there. So let me give them to you. Maybe you could jot them down. There's six relational requirements with sin that we need to share together as we prepare to go back into our local assemblies, seeking God for revival there and through there to the community in which we have been called. Revival in my relationship to sin. Here we go. Number one, I must see the problem with sin. I must see, and perhaps you could add the word freshly 
the problem with sin. I don't believe that in a room like this with people like you, that there's many of you who do not give mental assent and acknowledgement to sin's presence in you. It is not just the presence that needs to be recognized. It is the problem that needs to be freshly seen. We need to see again the problem. I must see the problem with sin. Because of its remaining presence in us, we have a propensity to become familiar with it and therefore lacks toward it. So let me just go back to the beginning and be sure that we understand these verses. This is the message that we, that we is the apostolic we. This is the message that we, the apostles, have heard from him, that is Jesus, and proclaimed to you, that is the saints, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is the beginning of the problem of sin. There is no darkness in him. One of the metaphors that John loves is that light is the purity of the holiness and the perfections morally of God and darkness represents the impurity and the unrighteousness and the moral impurity of creation and humanity. The problem is, is that we have been brought into reconciliation through the light of the world that has come to seek and to save the lost. And yet there is this necessary, fresh awareness that must rest on us of the problem of our sin. It is darkness in the midst of light. John loves this. He speaks of darkness as being outside of Christ, darkness as under Satan's power, darkness as spiritually dead, darkness as working wickedness, darkness as the characteristic of hell, darkness as spiritual blindness, and light reflected throughout the New Testament is in with Christ and under the Spirit's power, and light is spiritually alive, and light is working righteousness, and light is characteristic of heaven, and light is the spiritual sight that we possess as the people of Christ. So don't misunderstand the target audience. John is not writing this as an evangelistic letter. He's writing this to people who have placed their faith and confidence in Jesus Christ, and he is reminding them that the problem has to be freshly seen with sin. We have been made right with God through faith in Christ, and yet in our darkness that remains on us, in sin in us, we are standing in opposition to the very essence and the beauty and the holiness of the God who has shown his grace and saved us. Understand that? It goes further. He makes sure that we feel that in verse six. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, there's the distinction, if we talk of fellowship with Jesus while we walk in darkness in sin, we lie and do not practice the truth. This is, this is the problem. And if we don't have a fresh sense of the problem, if we don't see the problem of sin freshly, that we will not be a people leaving here positioned for God to do a reviving work in our local assembly and through our local assembly into our communities. If we say, now John moves from his apostolic we because he has presented the truth again of God's light and there is no darkness in him to us. Now John wraps the we in everybody that knows and follows Jesus in faith. If we then, all of us, the ones who we're talking to and us as an apostolic leadership, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Listen, in the power of the spirit that awakened your dead heart and gave hearing to your deaf spiritual ears and gave sight to your blind spiritual eyes. Listen, in the power of the spirit, he awakened you to a talk and a walk that are transformed by his grace. Now here's, the, here's, our, here's our problem. Because of the deceptiveness, Hebrews 3, 12 and 13, the deceptiveness of sin which remains in our members. We are prone to allow a gap to grow between our talk and our walk, right? Pastors in the room, if you haven't read Dangerous Calling by our brother Paul Tripp, it needs to happen yesterday. We are prone to a gap, and that gap is a deceptive gap, and that gap is a revival quenching gap between talk and walk. 
It's not true. You are not actually in fellowship with Christ and walking in the darkness. That's a lie. That's what John's saying. So, number one, relating to sin together exactly the same way means that we all, each and all, see the problem with sin freshly. This is hypocrisy. That's what comes out of not seeing sin as the problem that it really is, right? And nobody likes a hypocrite. Nobody likes a hypocrite. Your community has people in it who regularly say that they don't go to a church and they may not go to your church because the church is full of hypocrites. A revival happens when hypocrisy dies. I grew up in a home that... uh, My parents were first-generation Christians. They loved Jesus with all of their heart, and they wanted every gospel influence they could get. So we were the family that listened only to those kids' programs that were about biblical truths. Adventures in Odyssey, anybody out there? Adventures in Odyssey, come on. Okay, I got one better for you, and this is gonna be fewer people in the room. We listened to Patch the Pirate. Come on, Patch the Pirate. Okay, all right. There's more of you than I thought. I'm disconcerted by that. There was a song that Patch taught us. It was about the hippo critter. (laughs) Hippo critter, hippo critter, say one thing and do the oppo sitter. (laughs) It's a phony life full of empty glitter. God's not pleased with a counterfeiter. I mean, the rhymes are tight, right? I mean, we... (laughs) Ron Hamilton wasn't going for R&B, but he was close. He was in there. (laughs) That song's true. Say one thing and do the opposite. Claim something of fellowship with Christ while walking in the darkness. I just want us to feel this as we prepare to go. That the need for revival is because of the presence of remaining sin, and remaining sin in me is what is generating the need for us to be a people who position ourselves for the sovereign grace of God to work a revival in us and then through us for the expansion and the growth of his kingdom work. So without an accurate sightline on sin, we're prone to be a people who do not relate rightly to sin. We relate lightly to sin. That's what happens. So, number one in our relationship to ongoing sin is I must see the problem with sin. Number two, you tracking with me? Number two, revival of my relationship to sin. Number two, I must embrace the hope for sin. There is hope. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. And there is hope. Because verse seven dawns in this argument with the word but at the beginning. Here's the contrast. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, which we have every privilege to do, every power to do, because of the regenerating work of the Spirit, because of the persistence of the faithfulness of God to us, because of his leadership and grace through the gospel in us, there's a gospel-shaped way for us to live. As Mike so helpfully unpack for us, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. That is good news. That is hope for us. As the forgiven, in Christ through faith, justified through faith, declared righteous, positionally made right before God, The entire record of our sin positionally has been credited to him and he has paid its penalty in full at his cross. When he screamed testelestai, he was getting it all done for you and for me. And yet, in the fallenness of this world, sin remains on us positionally dealt with and declared righteous. But progressively, progressively, we are cleansed. We are cleansed. There is hope in the remaining sin. If you do not see the problem, you will deal lightly instead of relating rightly to sin. 
But if you do not grasp and embrace and hang on to and cling to and memorize and meditate upon the hope for sin, then you'll be drowning in the despair of remaining sin. And some of you have come to this conference in that position. I pray that the the dawning of the gospel has come with all of its hope again for you, Christian. John is writing to believers, or at least those who profess to be believers, and he is reminding them that there is hope for them. If they will walk in the light as he is in the light, there will be a sweet fellowship with each other in the light. Oh, that's the fertile soil for revival to spring and sprout and bear fruit. The sweet fellowship together as we walk in the light of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christians walk in the light because they have fellowship with God through faith in the light of the world, his son who has brought his light into our darkness. No exceptions. That's the believer's life. Struggle, yes. Besetting sins and propensities, yes. Perpetual defeat and values of darkness reigning in us, no, no. Because the king of the world, the light of the world is alive and has brought his light to bear upon us. Walk in the light. There is hope for sin. So number one, I must see the problem with sin. Number two, if we're gonna relate together with remaining sin, I must embrace the hope for sin. Number three, jot it down, I must stop the denial of sin. I must stop this. I've gotta stop denying sin. Look at verse eight. Second problem, the first problem is in verse six if we say, now the second if we say is in verse eight, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So error number two is the denial of sin. The concept here is that I have no more sin. I have arrived, I've made it. And I am no longer sinning. And I know that most of you would not come from a theological tradition that taught you that that was possible. Maybe some. But practically, we have been a part of local assemblies that taught us to act like that's true. And therefore, we posture as if we have no sin. We mask ourselves as if we have no sin. We facade as if there is no sin. We deny the very presence of sin. I mean, perhaps you're extremely uncomfortable that this is the closing session of our conference. Really? This is the pick-me-up before we go home? You better believe it, because this is where, this is it. This is the need. This is why we're here for revival. This is why we're here for church planting. This is why we're here for the development of churches into multiplication centers for the glory and the mission of Jesus Christ, because sin is here. So stop denying. I must stop denying it. It's deceiving ourselves. It's telling ourselves lies. My kids are fascinating. The kids are, the kids are just, they're, they're game changers in your life. I mean, you, you, one of the main things that kids do is they bring back the things you said to your parents. They don't try. It's just of the Lord that they do it. <laughs> Our kids, for a season, and thankfully this season is wrapping up because the consequences have become more significant, we're prone to say, I don't need a bath. I don't need a shower. It's as if they literally were blind to the cause for showers. Nose blind, perhaps? (laughs) Nay and I weren't. We could see fully. There was a deep need for shower. Deep need for bath time. Oh, I don't need that. Their proclamation to us was that Dirtiness was not their thing. They were somehow in the mass of humanity, which has biological issues going on that create things all the time. Like skin is falling off of us today. It's a hard thought for me. I got real problems with it. (laughs) They were testifying with their, I don't need that, that that actually wasn't their thing. In the middle of all this humanity, they somehow were playing at recess, out in the neighborhood, rolling around, doing all these things, but they had somehow avoided dirtiness. And we always win. You are dirty. 
You're lying to yourself. The truth is not in you. <laughs> Use soap. Clean your whole body, please. How foolish we are as the people of Jesus Christ, positionally rescued and secured forever in his righteousness, to act as if we do not sin anymore. We have no sin. The truth is not in us. And gospel churches are messy churches, my brothers and sisters. Gospel churches are places where sin is acknowledged and expected, but never, never treated lightly in the presence of God's people. See, that's very different. It's either two extremes. It's like it's expected and we just have warm and fuzzies about all the sin and like we call that uh, authenticity and that's like we just all puke about sin and then there's nothing happening. And then the other extreme is we just fake it like we're not sinning. So like if somebody actually ends up being exposed in sin, we're all like, oh my goodness. I didn't even think those things were happening in the world again. I thought that was like Cain and Abel level stuff. It seems like the extremes. Rather than saying, of course there's sin. Of course I'm sinning. Of course you're sinning. And there is hope for our sin. And we will not deny our sin. We will acknowledge our sin. If you say you have no sin, you're deceiving yourself. Be done with the denial of sin. Okay, that's the third one. Stop the denial. Which leads then right into the fourth one. You can feel it coming. If remaining sin creates the need, and we need to relate together in the exact same way. The number four is, I must practice the confession of sin. As a positionally secure, justified, declared righteous, completely covered, no condemnation for us now in Christ Jesus, people on planet Earth, in the presence of this broken flesh and the remaining sin in us, I must, I must practice the confession of sin. So John just says it. It's the most familiar verse in the paragraph. If we, that is the apostles and the believers that he's writing to, if we confess our sins because we have them, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, jot down Psalm 51 verses three and four. Actually, just Psalm 51 will do. Take the whole thing in. David lays out a powerful example, inspired by the Spirit of God, of true confession leading to repentance. Jot down James chapter 5 and verse 16, where we are commanded to confess our sins to one another. There is this fighting of the denial of sin through the verbalization of the confession of sin. This is where we struggle. It's where I struggle. Perhaps it's where you struggle. But we can't have diversity in this room about how we relate to sin and expect to be positioned in a way where the revival that we desire will come to our church family and through our church family and to our community. You understand? We must verbalize. I am a sinner and I have sinned in this way. I agree with God about my action. I agree with God about my attitude. I agree with God about my words. I agree with God about this pattern. I agree with God about my addiction. I agree with God. What God says is what matters, and I will confess it. I am owning it. I agree with you. That's the word. I agree with you, God. Your definitions are the definitions. Ooh, that is rough. Because we live in a culture that wants to shape and mold every definition to have the least amount of condemnation connected to it. Not us. We will know no condemnation. But we will not lightly take the cross where the payment was made for our sins when we see them in our remaining flesh. So, I'm a sinner, and this is how I've sinned. I agree with God, and I agree to God, and I agree to other people in my church family, about my sin. I verbalize my agreement. I sorrow and I grieve in my agreement and I repent because of his loving kindness and I walk forward trusting his spirit to help me toward obedience in agreement with him. Is that how you're relating? Listen, if you're not relating with seeing 
the problem freshly with sin, embracing the hope for sin in the work of Christ, stopping the denial of sin, and practicing the confession of sin, then I am sure we are not, I don't care how many conferences we go to that are setting us up for revival, I don't care how much we're talking about it, we are not positioned for the sovereign one of heaven and earth to work revival in us and then through us. And it will all be for naught. We had a few days. Let's steward them with full awareness of our need. It's remaining sin. That's number four. Here's number five. I must trust the Savior with sin. I must practice the confession of sin, but I must trust the Savior with sin. Why would I trust him? Why would I verbalize that? Why would I say it? Why would I act as if that's there? Why would I, why would I in any way give the impression that I have sin? Because he is faithful and he's just. And he will forgive us from all our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the second part of verse nine. If we confess, that is, the, that is the prerequisite. He is faithful and he is just. He won't fail. He won't fail you in your confession. And it will be right. He will do what's right. How could it be right for him not to crush us when we confess our sin? How could it be right for him not to stamp us out? Oh, you're gonna own your sin? Boom, done. How could that not be the way it happens? Because he was crushed for our iniquity. Because he bore our sin penalty in his wounds. He took that for us. He is faithful. He will never forget what he did. And he is just. He will be righteous in doing what he does when you and I confess our sin. And what will he do? He will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He will, he will in a familial relationship, secured through faith in him as sons and daughters of the Most High God who are confessing the presence and the reality of this remaining sin in us as we see it, as the Spirit convicts us of it, he will then work the familial forgiveness we desperately need and he will bring the familial cleansing, not the cleansing of our washing of our hearts. He's done that. But he will freshly cleanse us in our conscience to walk forward as his people on his mission. Man, I had a rough childhood, or I should say my parents had a rough childhood because I lived a rough childhood. I was a rebel, and I was passionate about it. I know it's hard to believe, but I was passionate about it. I've been passionate about whatever I'm about. And man, when it was all about rebellion, I was all in. That meant that I came to the dinner table many nights with that thick tension of what I had done and said in that day. How many of you overt rebels with me, come on, can own that you sat at those tables? Okay, let's go the other direction. How many of you parents are sitting at those tables? All right. You know what my dad said to me one time? I'll never forget this. He sat on my bed. Now that I'm a parent, I know that he was out of ideas. Didn't know what to say. And he said, whatever you do, you are my son, and I will love you. Were we broken in our relationship? 100% we were. Were we talking the way we had been talking? No. But I was a Bailey, and I am one today. And my father would not turn his back on his son. Listen to me, he was a beautiful beautiful illustration. You have been made a son or a daughter of God through faith in his finished work. Your adoption is settled and final. He will never turn his back on you. You are his. He loves you. In fact, when you own the presence of sin and the practice of sin in confession before him, he is faithful. He won't fail. And he's just. It's right for him to do it because he paid the penalty through his own son's sacrifice for you. He is faithful and just to forgive you to make the lines of communication all that they were intended to be and to cleanse you, to bring all that filth of that sin that remains, to bring it, wash that away so that we can walk forward in the progression of his sanctifying grace in our lives. You understand? It's a gift. We're just so arrogant that we don't take him up on it. 
God, forgive us. We have to relate the same way. We have to see the problem. We have to embrace the hope. We have to stop the denial. We have to practice the confession and we have to trust the Savior. Are you trusting him? Or are you trusting yourself when you sin? You say, well, how will I know? Well, whose payment are you banking on to make the pain of the guilt go away? You ever seen those pictures of self-flagellation, smacking themselves in the back with a, you ever seen that? Anybody seen those? I remember as a little kid looking at uh, National Geographic magazine. My grandma had all of them. They had those little folder things. Anybody ever those, the yellow magazines? I mean, those things were awesome. It's like totally aging me. I mean, we didn't have cell phones. We were looking at National Geographic magazines and seeing people beating themselves and thinking, wow, that's a crazy religion. There's a Protestant form of that where you try to take the penalty for yourself to relieve the pressure of your guilt for the sin. Trust the Savior. He is faithful and he is just. Okay, that's the fifth one. Here's the sixth one. Listen, last night, Jeff Mile made a promise that we'd be done by 1130. He lied to you. <laughs> Actually, he told the truth, and I've overridden that, and uh, we're not gonna be done, but I hope that you will be benefited no less. Number six, I remember the stain from sin. I must remember the stain from sin. So one more problem is present that John wants to address in verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, there's a far more significant issue at stake. The way this is written, if you're a grammar person, is that this is a perfect tense verb. It means that it, it's a past action with an ongoing effect. It means that I was never in sin and I'm still not in sin. If we start to think of ourselves in that way, we are running headlong toward a damning implication. That's what he says. If we say we've not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Start to believe that you were never really a sinner and that you're not one today. Start to believe that there was never really anything significant that was wrong. There was never an offense against the holy moral character of your creator. There was no breach of his righteous law. There was no need for repentance and faith and salvation. There was no need. There was no darkness. You're in the light. You can see you're fine. Forget the stain, and you are running headlong into a damning implication. That's what he says. The word is not in us. Heard it, maybe, but it's not in us. Familiar with it, perhaps, but not in us. No, the people who have the word in them, the people who have the gospel in them, the people who have the truth in them are a people who remember the stain of the sin nature with which they were born and the actions in which they lived it out. Don't try to forget the stain of our sin nature or you will diminish the impact of the gospel on your life and the testimony that comes from you. The Apostle Paul was such an example of this. He never abandoned the stain of sin. He recounted it. He was the chief of sinners. Sinner saint, yes. Write it in your notes, sinner saint. But do not forget the sinner part, or we will not be a people positioned for God to do his reviving work. Some of you are people who say, I'm fine. You say, I'm fine all the time. You say, I'm fine. You, the thermometer says you have a blazing fever. I'm fine. The x-rays say something's definitely wrong. I'm fine. The MRI comes back. I'm fine. The blood test, liars, I'm fine. I'm okay. We're not fine, and we never were, but we are redeemed. He has always been fine. He has never been with sin. He was tempted in every way like us, yet without sin, he paid for the penalty in full for our sin. Those who don't believe that they've sinned and never come to repentance 
are under the condemnation that their sin has earned. Sin is like gravity. You can say it's not there, but go ahead and jump. It's there. Revived Christians are marked by renewed memory. It is not that we wallow in the stain of our sin. It's that we never forget it because on the backdrop of the stain of our sin, the glorious good news of Jesus Christ pops. We have a treasure in earthen vessels. We have a diamond in the middle of a clay pot. Remaining sin. Christians can always see sin. They don't forget it. They apply the gospel to it. Amen? Okay, this is the need. Remaining sin in me creates the need for ongoing revival in me. I must see the problem. I must embrace the hope. I must stop the denial. I must practice the confession. I must trust the Savior. And I must remember the stain. I think that will get us toward a uniform relationship with remaining sin and position all of us to be instruments in revival because we are the recipients of revival. May God do it. All right, take three things home. Don't close up shop. Number one, let me give you some assignments to help you live because we've learned. Number one, describe your relationship to sin. Christian, describe it. Spend some time. On the airplane, put a notes app up on your phone and describe your actual relationship to sin. How do you relate to it? What's the normal way? How does it go? What do you think? How do you re respond? What, what are the interactions like? Like, what's your relationship? That's number one. Number two, cultivate a more biblical grid for remaining sin. Buy the gospel primer by Milton Vincent and soak in it so that you and I cultivate a more biblical grid for remaining sin so that the gospel becomes central and functional for us in our persistence of remaining sin. Cultivate that. It's gonna take meditation on God's word, chewing the cud of his truth, memorizing his precious promises and his declarations over you. Describe your relationship to sin. Cultivate a more biblical grid for remaining sin. And then number three, jot it down. Utilize your relationship to sin for the mission. It's lunacy to think that we're gonna sin with people and then tell them of the gospel that transforms us. It's also lunacy to think that you will be the one who acts as if you don't sin and then tell them of the gospel that transforms. Your sin and my sin and its persistence, our failure is an opportunity for the grace of God to be on our lives and through our lips for the mission of Jesus Christ. This is the need for revival. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this portion of your word and this sweet time in a conference like this to study it. Would you, Spirit of God, do whatever needs to be done with the word Convict, guide, point it all out, do whatever needs to be done. I pray for, perhaps we have friends in the room who have professed to know you, but are without the power of your spirit. Always learning, but never coming to a knowledge of the truth. I pray that you would break through the darkness and bring the light, that they would humble themselves. And as your spirit draws, they would run in faith to Christ. Would you humble us as your people where we have played fast and loose with sin, where we have not been as we ought to be? Would you remind us of your love, our position, and your promise of progressive work in us? Lead us now to repentance. And may the bread and the cup be the seal of our memory of the stain of our sin, overcome by the blood of your son, who has washed us pure, whiter than snow. Jesus, we thank you. May you be glorified now, we pray in your name, amen. All right, we're gonna take communion together before we go and 
I think this is an appropriate way for us to remember what Christ has accomplished for us. Just two things before we do that. Let's be careful not to mock the cross. The cross did break the power of sin, so where repentance is needed, let's confess our sin. Let's run in faith to Christ. Let's let the bread and the cup become a seal of our repentance, not a mockery in our sin pattern. Number two, the cross unified us as a people where disunity is reigning in the body of Christ. We are mocking the very purpose of the cross to unify us as a people who were not a people. So let's be careful as we take these elements. Paul was clear in his warnings. Perhaps you're not a follower of Jesus and it's becoming clear to you. Please just let this happen around you. Our team's gonna pass this down the row in just a minute. And as they do that, you can just pass it on, let it go. This doesn't wash anyone's sins away. It doesn't make anybody okay if something bad happens today. This is an external, symbolic, spiritual reminder of what is internal and eternal that has happened on our behalf. Amen? Okay. Our team's gonna pass it. Scripture's gonna be on the screen for you to consider. Go ahead, team. And as they send this down the rows, would you reflect on the gospel, repent where needed, and I'll come back in just a moment and rejoice with you in taking it. Now listen, there's two cups. Sorry, it's Christ Church, I forgot to tell you. There's two cups. Bottom one has the bread, top one has the juice. Don't leave the bread in there. It'll be weird in a minute. Let's consider the gospel as we prepare to celebrate. First Corinthians chapter 11 tells us that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed in the upper room, eating the Passover meal with his disciples, took two of the elements of that meal and reassigned their significance for us in the new covenant and as his people, the church. The first is the bread. He took the bread and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, it was flat bread, it was unleavened bread, signifying the speedy exodus from the captivity in Egypt. But now, the king of heaven said, this is my body, which is for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. Let's remember his body torn for us. In the same way also, he took the cup, the third of four cups in the Passover meal. This one signifying the promise of re redemption for Israel. And Jesus reassigns it now for his disciples for all generations. He took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. The due agreement has been made. The lamb long awaited has come to be slain. The high priest who could offer the sacrifice once for all and be seated has come. Do this as often as you drink it and remember to me, let's remember his sacrifice of blood for us. Thank you, Jesus. Paul tells us as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we're proclaiming the Lord's death. Across the room, we're saying his death was sufficient. It's our salvation. And Paul says, until he comes. He is not dead. This is not a funeral. He's alive. Amen? And he will come back for us. Let's stand to our feet. Having proclaimed with the bread and the cup, but sing our praise to the one who paid our price.
Lord for that. Amen. Maybe let two people right there. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. That we can take the bread and cup and then praise the Lord and thank him for his blood. Where would we be? I have been so blessed. I just want to take a moment just quickly. Our team, the green room's kind of right behind that drum thing, and we walk off just as, as, just as amazed as you guys are by the time that the Spirit has met with us in such a powerful way. It's been truly a privilege and a joy to lead you. If every weekend was like this, man, it'd be easy. But I'm super thankful that you've come ready to meet with Jesus and to sing, I cannot believe how sweet it has been. It's just blown all of our prayers, I think, all of our expectations. God has truly met with us and revival has taken place. Can you imagine what heaven will be like when there is no more sin, when there is no more suffering, there's no numbers or budgets or things that we have to worry about. It's just Jesus face to face in his presence. So let's sing about it. Let's sing about heaven, the place that is promised, the living hope that is only found in Jesus. Let's sing this together as our close. Leave it all on the table, okay? Come on.
From the throne room came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was as it was a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second like a creature of an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, full of eyes all around and within, day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Let's sing holy, holy, holy. The song we'll sing for an eternity. Let's lift this up. Stay standing. I've just got a couple things to say to you. Number one, thank you again to Pastor Adam for bringing us that final message. What a way to do it, right? Oh my goodness. So good for my own heart. Number two, I just want to ask you, there's literally to do this so many, there's a thousand things that have to happen for this event to go off. And behind the scenes, there have been people working literally day and night uh, to make this happen from our congregation here at Christ Church. Would you just give a round of applause and a huge thank you to them? Thank you. Huge, huge. You're not on the ho- you're not on the clo- ho- you're can not you, the closing can you mute host. Him? Can you mute him, Corey? What Jeff just did there, we find all throughout the Apostle Paul's epistles. He tells the church in Corinth, recognize those who do both devote themselves to the service of the saints. He does it to groups of people like Jeff just did. But then there's times where he gets specific. He's gotten a certain reason or a certain person for a certain devotion. I love when he does it in the book of Philippians chapter two, when he tells the church in Ephesus about Timothy and he says this, he says, there is no one else like him. And for Vintage Con 2022, there is no one else like the man to my left, Jeff Mile, our vintage director. Wait, I'm not done. No, no, not yet, not yet. Thank him. We're going to thank him in a minute. But first, Jeff, I want to say thank you to you for your devotion to the gathering that is here. Thank you for the way that you set aside your business over the last six months, for the hours, the sacrifice. And most of all, thank you for not just caring about a conference that it was executed well, but a conference where God was at work. 
for the uplifting of his people. So in a small token of appreciation, we want to send you on a trip. You can take Chrissy as well. <laughs> if she's got time off, you need to rest, relax, rejoice in what God has done in your service. I trust that it'll be a blessing to you. Let's thank Jeff for his service. All right, I don't like any of that. All praise to God. Hey, some of you were not in yet when we said this on your um, seat today when you came in. There was a parting gift. This is, uh, we, this is a book we just commend to you. Uh, hopefully it will be something that will encourage you on your way out, just something to keep you in this rhythm of revival as you go. So take that with you. If you need an extra copy, take that with you. Give that to somebody who needs that. We'd love for you to be able to give that. Um, some have asked, hey, like, I didn't get to go to everything I wanted to go to. Don't worry, it was all recorded. We'll get it out to you. There's a resource guide that we'll get to you, so make sure you do that. We wanna know how we did. We're gonna send you out at some point in the near future, a very short, very brief survey. We wanna know. We genuinely, honestly wanna know Hey man, what was impacting to you? There'll be just a few short questions on that. So if you would uh, answer that for us. Um, I know you loved Vance. If you didn't get Vance's book uh, when you were in the story, just came out with a brand new book. Uh, we're selling it cheaper, but I think we might be out. But I got a free copy if anybody needs it right here. This is just a fun little copy to give away. Um, and the last couple things for you, the store will be open just for 30 minutes after this. We know some of you gotta run, but that'll be open. Um, there's a save the date. Uh, for next year already. We cannot wait. Uh, VintageCon, we just cannot wait for this in this sweet, sweet time. Travel safe. And as we say here at Christ Church every week, this is our thing, okay? So we want to impart this maybe as a little benediction over you today as we go, right? We have gathered together and now we go to scatter, right? On mission for Christ. And as you do that, go with this truth stamped on you. You are loved. <laughs>